Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to India Power Talk. India Power Talk is a knowledge sharing initiative. We invite international thought leaders and domain experts to share their insights, experiences, and strategies related to business and the economy. The result is an easily accessible digital source of knowledge that benefits not only Indian entrepreneurs and policymakers, but also international businesses, investors, and strategic partners who have invested in or intend to invest in India. Our speakers include entrepreneurs, economists, professors, investment bankers, inventors, scientists, lawyers, chartered accountants, and other senior professionals with experience in diverse sector. The great thinker and humanist Buckminster Fuller said in one of the world's most quotable quotes, think global, act local. And this is exactly what our topic today is all about. Utah, America's newest economic powerhouse. On one hand, we want to look at the US state of Utah and what makes it so successful. On the other, we want to take in the geopolitical big picture. Utah is an amazing success story. It's a landlocked state without significant natural resources, yet economically very healthy. It has been recognized as the number one US state for GDP growth, the state with the best economy and the number one best state for entrepreneurs. It has also been honored as the best state for the middle class and it is the state with the most upward economic mobility. The list of accolades just goes on and on. But perhaps what's most interesting is to look at how the state has achieved this strong position over the years and what aspects of its success story can be replicated. Which industries have contributed most? Which policies have enabled development? How does Utah tie in with the larger global agenda in terms of US foreign affairs as well as trade and in particular with India? These are just some of the thoughts we want to examine during our talk. And for this, our guest today is extremely experienced and with high credentials to provide deep insights into these topics. Miles Hansen, President and CEO of the World Trade Center, Utah. He also draws his vast experience with the US Department of State working across the Middle East and in the White House. This combination of private and public sector work, local and global perspectives gives him an extraordinary overview of world affairs. As head of World Trade Center Utah, which belongs to the World Trade Center Association headquartered in New York City, Miles has a far reaching responsibilities. The mission of WTC is to guide Utah companies into profitable global markets. The organization helps companies evaluate their global position and international strategies and also offers education in the form of seminars and workshops. Miles' service with the US State Department of State reaches back many years. In addition, he was the director of Gulf Affairs with the US National Security Council from 2017 to 2018. He has published articles on many topics, including mediation and inter intercultural issues. In addition to his native English, he speaks Arabic, Persian, and Russian. So welcome, Miles. Good evening. And thank you for joining us on my India Power Talk. Thank you, Nitin, very much for the opportunity. And, and first off, let me say congratulations. Over the past year and a half during this pandemic, it's been a very challenging time for many of us. But as we've seen, we've all fit, had to figure out how to adapt and innovate and overcome and I think India Power Talks is a great example how you were able to take, despite the challenges of the pandemic, see that there would be a need for these types of virtual interactions. And here I am in the morning in, in Salt Lake City, you are in New Delhi in, in the evening time, and we have an opportunity to engage, to learn from each other, and you're creating this great content uh, for your audience. And so again, congratulations. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, I talked to, to Ron Gunnell yesterday, who you've had on, and Franz Kolb. Uh, is, is a good friend of mine. So I'd encourage anybody, if they have missed, uh, if they, they haven't seen your uh, your session with Ron and Franz, go and check that out because they're going to have great perspectives on, on Utah and the United States as well. But anyways, thank you, Nitin, very much for the opportunity. So my, it's, it's, it's sheer my pleasure. And it's great to see three 
great speakers from one state of U U.S. That's Utah. Uh, that shows the, that U Utah is really a powerhouse. <laughs> yes. Uh, Miles, to begin with, would you share a little of your background? How did you arrive at the Department of State? How did you develop your unique combination of public and private sector work? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to explain this in a little bit in depth, not just to talk about myself, but my experience is so typical for so many people here in the state of Utah that they, I think they, that my background, my experience, my story uh, will help uh, help people understand why Utah, this little landlocked state in the mountains of the West United States, is such an internationally minded place. And so I, I grew up in Utah. I had very little international experience. I'd been to, I think, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, right across the border of Washington State into Canada, and Tijuana, uh, just across the border from San Diego and Mexico. But otherwise, no international experience. I finished high school, and I chose to serve as a missionary uh, for my church, and I, I got asked to go to Russia. And uh -huh. so I went to St. Petersburg, Russia as an 18-year-old, spent two years, learned Russian, uh, had this incredible international experience. That was really my first time uh, in another culture, in another environment. I felt like I was uh, totally unprepared. Uh, but when I got there and after two years, you kind of figure things out. You, you gain a very deep appreciation for other countries and, and, and cultures. I developed this language ability with Russian. So I came back, I uh, studied uni university here in Utah, um, ended up studying international relations. And I got asked, uh, I, I had to do an international internship and I, uh, there was a, a girl that I kind of liked and she was going to do an internship in Geneva, Switzerland. And so I said, that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I, I probably want to do the same program. Uh, lo and behold, they didn't find me an internship in Switzerland, but they found one for me in Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> and so I went and I spent, uh, spent several months living and working in Kyrgyzstan. And then I traveled elsewhere in Central Asia. And that really was my first experience in, his, in, in, in Muslim countries. And this was a few years after 9-11. And what I experienced was so different from what I'd seen on the news. So I came back to Brigham Young University, uh, started studying Farsi. That took me back to Tajikistan to do a year-long uh, Farsi program. Uh, and then from there, ended up going uh, to graduate school in Washington, D.C. And I did a program where uh, the State Department paid for my graduate school in exchange for a service commitment. And so you see this very direct line from uh, being from Utah, living in Russia for two years, doing these internships, and then developing these language skills, initially Russian and Farsi. And that took me to the State Department where I had an opportunity to work on Iran uh, for several years from Dubai and Armenia. And I spent some time in Washington, D.C. doing some counterterrorism work uh, back in Saudi Arabia. I learned a little Arabic on the way and then ultimately back working at the White House uh, on Middle East issues before I came back here to Utah to work at World Trade Center, Utah. Great. What a fascinating journey, Miles. Uh, truly fascinating. Uh, you know, as I mentioned during my introduction, um, uh, Utah occupies a special position as one of the most economically successful U.S. states. Uh, now, could you please dwell upon how uh, has this been possible and uh, what do you think were the main contributing factors? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. You mentioned a few of those accolades uh, early on, and it's incredible to see how Utah was, was the top economy in the country before the pandemic. And, and, it, and I, I assume that you've, you've heard people talk about the pandemic as the great accelerator. And so trends that existed before the pandemic, those trend lines just got steeper. Or if there were negative trends, they got uh, steeper going the other direction. And so Utah had these great positive trends coming into the pandemic. And then the pandemic has greatly accelerated uh, things. And so if we were the best economy in the nation before the pandemic, that's certainly true now. I mean, there are some parts of the state that have an unemployment rate of less than 2%. Uh, the state overall is less than 3%. And so that just shows how, how strong the economy is. And in fact, we have some challenges related to this growth. And the reason why, in my mind, you can boil it down in, into three primary factors. One, uh, starting with kind of a, a government perspective, you know, here we don't believe that government drives economic growth, but government certainly can create a framework. And in Utah, we have a very unique approach to politics. Like I mentioned, I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. And my experience is that right now, politics in Washington, D.C. is destructive. And what I mean by that is typically uh, as ideas go through the political process in Washington, D.C., 
if a policy comes out at all, if Congress can get something passed, in my mind, it's usually worse than what either side started with. And so that political process is not developing good policies, but in fact, the, the political process makes things worse and not better. Um, my experience here in Utah has been the opposite. And here we have a very constructive approach to politics. And we have politics like anywhere. The mayor of Salt Lake City is typically a Democrat. The governor is, is almost always a Republican. Uh, we have a, a legislature that ha plays very active and plays a very strong role. And so you get the same political process. But what I've noticed is as policies go through this political process, the policies that come out are almost always better than what either their side started with. So you see this constructive political environment. And what that allows us to do is to be very pragmatic, to solve problems, to create this framework of collaboration in which the private sector can really thrive. Yeah. And so that is, is, is one key factor to Utah's economic success. Another one is uh, we have just a, an incredible innovative workforce. We have the youngest uh, workforce anywhere in the country. Uh, we have this uh, great universities. We have this belief uh, here in Utah as part of our DNA that we can go out and, and do anything. And, and, and I wish you could see out my window to my left, but there's a, there's a little hill here in Salt Lake City called Enzyme Peak. Mm -hmm. And it's just a little hill. It's up above Salt Lake City. But if you think about Utah's history, and for those who aren't familiar, Utah was settled by religious refugees who were driven out of Missouri and Illinois and they left here and they came to Utah with nothing. They were refugees, just like we see refugees all around the world. And when they arrived here, and this is one thing that I, that I love about Utah's history, they arrived here in this valley with, there is nothing. Uh, and they climbed up on top of this little hill, Enzyme Peak. And this was the second day after they arrived, right? So they've been driven out of the United States. They've uh, walked a thousand miles across the plains and the mountains. They've just arrived into this, this desolate valley and a small group of the leaders climbed up on top of this hill. And when they were up there, they looked out across this valley. And what they said is they said, we are going to build a city with global influence, a wow. place to which all the nations of the world will come. And you think about the, the, the guts and the courage that that took to say, you know what, we have nothing right now, but we're gonna build something with global significance. But they didn't stop right there. They, went, they climbed down that hill they rolled up their sleeves and they went to work. And it was very, very hard and difficult, but we see now that they were exactly right. They succeeded in that. And so as, as I'm interacting with companies all day, every day, it's fascinating because you'll have small little companies that have the same combination of vision for global influence and success, as well as that, uh, that grit and willingness to work very, very hard. And you put those two things together and you end up with these companies that are just doing incredible things and they operate within this government framework to be very successful. And then the last factor very quickly is how globally minded uh, people here in Utah are. We speak 130 languages more than anywhere else in the nation. We have more people who have lived in other countries per capita than anywhere else in the country. And that gets back to my story because there are people just like me who you know, graduate high school and either as missionaries uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ, or Peace Corps volunteers, or they're going out to do other service projects. There is a tradition of young people leaving home right after school to go live in other parts of the United States and other countries uh, to gain a greater appreciation. They then come back just like me, changed, and having a very strong desire to engage with the rest of the world. And so uh, we are uh, this very cosmopolitan and globally minded society which enables us to find the best things out in the world and to bring them and apply them here. And when you put those three factors together, what you end up with is it just this, this economic powerhouse and the society that is functioning very well. And we have a very high quality of life. And it's all because uh, we here in the state of Utah, we know how to properly apply these pragmatic principles that lead to prosperity. So you are, because you are the visionary founders and not only visionary founders, but we, they, as you rightly said, they, came down and they and they started working on their own. That makes yes. a lot of difference. Now, just to complete that uh, narration, uh, Miles, uh, maybe maybe I would like to ask you uh, to tell our viewers as to which are the industries and service sectors that have uh, developed so far ahead of the national average? Yep, that's right. It's, it's interesting. And if you look back 
uh, 30 or 40 years, Utah's economy was very much dominated by uh, extracting natural resources. So we had a very strong mining industry. One of the largest copper mines in the world is, uh, is just about 10 miles uh, the other direction from me. And so Utah's economy is very dependent on mining. And I mention that because as we work with uh, other countries, uh, many other countries are trying to figure out how to diversify their economies. And Utah comes from a place where they were, uh, where we were very dependent on, on mining and extractives, coal, uh, copper, uh, other things like that. But now we have the most diversified economy in the United States. And so what that means is we are succeeding in, in, in virtually every industry, um, very diverse economy, but just a few key are uh, aerospace and defense. Mm -hmm. So we have Hill Air Force Base, which is uh, one of the largest uh, Air Force bases that the United States has here in the U.S. Um, we have a lot of desert areas, so the planes can take off and go fly and train out in the desert. Um, but because of that anchor point, we have many companies uh, in the aerospace and defense industry that are, have a very large presence here in Utah. We also have a very, very strong uh, healthcare innovation or life science industry. Okay. Um, we have uh, companies that for decades have been very prosperous in making medical devices. We are emerging as, as a new hub for biotechnology. In fact, our life science uh, industry is growing faster here in Utah than anywhere else in the nation. We call it, uh, Utah is known as the beehive state. So we refer to this industry as our, uh, as the biohive. And so we have this, these great group of companies in, in healthcare innovation and life sciences uh, that are important drivers of economic growth here. Um, the third that I'll mention is uh, uh, software and IT. We call it our uh, Silicon Slopes mm -hmm. instead of Silicon Valley because we have big mountains here. We have big slopes. <laughs> and so we have uh, many companies, uh, a lot of software as a service that have just been doing incredible things. Uh, we have been outperforming Silicon Valley um, global companies coming here to set up shop, uh, local Utah companies becoming global companies in their own right. And that has just been uh, this, this economic miracle in a lot of ways over the past 10 years. And that's going to continue as we move forward. And then finally, I'll, I'll mention last, um, just a great collection of consumer product companies, uh, both outdoor recreation companies that make backpacks and jackets and sleeping bags that are uh, doing very well, Black Diamond is mm -hmm. a global brand uh, that, that some of your listeners may be familiar with. They're located here in Utah, yes. uh, others as well. And then as well, uh, you know, Traeger Grills is a great company that just went public. They make uh, grills to cook meat on. And, and so you see these, these innovative uh, consumer products uh, that are doing uh, very well in markets uh, across the United States and also around the world. Great, great. Uh, now that that from there let us let's go to the the institution which you head. Uh, could you please talk about the World Trade Center, Utah, and yeah. and, and the its activities? And I'm I'm more curious to know uh, Miles from you because I know WTC is very active, uh, and and under your, your leadership it has been doing a lot of stuff uh, these days. Yeah, so World Trade Center, Utah, is a a, a private organization. We are one of 330 World Trade Centers all around the world. And in fact, we, we've done quite a bit of work with World Trade Center Mumbai, uh, which is our, our, partner, our, our partner organization. And so we, as a World Trade Center, we exist to try to, uh, the, the tagline is to make uh, doing business around the world as easy as it is to do it across the street. And so we work hard at building this great global network and, and great expertise with our partners around the world. And then we take that and we focus it in to figure out how do we accelerate growth for Utah companies and for the companies that we're working with in different parts of the world. And the way that we do that is we have this phenomenal global network of, of partners and friends all around the world. Uh, we have a, a number, we run a number of international programs that we do on behalf of the state of Utah. And so anytime you know, a governor is going to travel to another country on a trade mission, we're the ones that help organize that, put together a, a high impact business focused uh, program, get the right Utah companies to go and travel with the governor. We uh, organize uh, Utah booths at trade shows. So for example, we just took uh, eight or nine Utah companies to Dubai for Arab health. And we do a big, nice Utah booth 
we get eight or nine smaller companies in there. Um, and for these companies, they reported back after, you know, a, over $7 million of new trade opportunities resulting from the fact that they were able to come with us as part of Team Utah to, uh, to the trade show. And so uh, when it's not a pandemic, we would do, you know, eight or nine of those a year and a couple of trade missions and business trips. But we also manage a number of grant programs where we, are, we are work with the federal government to get grants where for small Utah companies, if they're trying to grow around the world, we can pay you know a few thousand dollars to help pay for travel, or we can help them get their website translated uh, to enter into a new market, uh, or to help them do other things that they need to do to grow uh, globally. And then the last key area that we focus in on are business services. And so we it can take any company through, uh, whether or not they've never exported or they've uh, exporting a lot in one region of the world, but they wanna to grow to another region. Uh, we can help them do market research, uh, do business analytics. Analytics. We can help them um, once they choose their market, put together their market entry strategy and figure oh. out who should they be working with in the market where they're heading, uh, which service providers can help them figure out uh, what it is that need, what they need to do to break into that market. And then when it's time to go uh, into the new market, we can lean on our global network to open doors, generate momentum, line up meetings for them. So ultimately, uh, again, our purpose is to help companies increase their international sales, uh, attract investment where that's helpful. And then in the process, we're just out there helping our partners around the world recognize Utah as a global hub for trade and investment and, uh, and, and, and international business. This is this is uh, minds. I must say, is so helpful, so helpful for the many uh, Indian forums, uh, in industry forums, industry chambers that they that they are working into in different uh, industry segments or otherwise. This 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 roadmap is very I, I guess will be very helpful to our audience. Now, uh, just as an addition to this, I, I may uh, I may ask you as to how does the World Trade Center Utah maintains its global connections? A and B. Uh, what are your future plans, if I may ask you? Yeah, absolutely. So we are constantly interacting with our partners uh, across the state of Utah and around the world. And as we're doing that, we are very, very deliberate to say we need to be building partnerships. For a partnership to work, it has to be mutually beneficial. It has to be grounded on, on action and activity that benefits both sides. And so just as, as a few examples, um, just in the past couple of weeks, we have hosted uh, delegations from several countries in Asia, as well as Europe. Uh, looking ahead next month, we've got two different delegations coming from Africa. When they arrive here in Utah, we will work very hard to make sure that they are able to connect with, uh, with other partner organizations, uh, businesses, and that we can help them, whether it's uh, business or education or cultural, or religious, whatever the initial goal is of this delegation coming to Utah, we're here to help them accomplish their objectives and we recognize that as we do that, then when we go to visit them or we have a company that needs assistance in that market or that country, then we're going to have partners that want to help. And so as we just very deliberately do this, building out and strengthening this network of partners around the world, that allows us to have connectivity in, in, in every region and in virtually every country. And then as we work with Utah companies and also universities and civil society and other organizations that have uh, international touch points, we then can help them see, okay, what are the opportunities? Once we know what country they need to connect with, then we can go to our partnership network and make some introductions. And we know that those partners are then going to go and uh, make other introductions. And it's just a, 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 a standard networking uh, process. But we want to make sure we have very strong networks uh, with our partners around the world. And we do that by uh, making sure that, A, we are very uh, active in engaging with our with our partners and potential partners and b that they can trust us as an uh, as, as an organization that is focused on action and and, and generating value for, for for both sides for both sides and as we do that consistently over a period of time that leads to having a phenomenal network great connectivity and then partners that are willing to to join with us in in going to work on behalf of of trade and investment Great. You know, that really it works very well, I guess, to maintain the global connections. Uh, and that's very, very essential as well. Uh, no, Mike, uh, Miles, you, you recently held a virtual trade mission 
uh, with the World Trade Center Mumbai, uh, I guess, where you connected more than 100 Utah companies to potential partners, uh, Indian partners. You connected them with Indian government officials, economic experts. I mean, if I may ask you, what impressions do you have about economic opportunity and, and how do you, you plan to move forward in the coming months? And maybe, or in the years to build a stronger trade and investment ties between between India and Utah, and, and you can be as critical as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, first off, um, India is such a tremendous country, so much human capital, such a large market, and it is growing uh, very, very quickly. And there's no question about that. Just yesterday I at lunch, I was there with with, with Ron Ganell, who who you've had on is an Indie Power talk. And our mutual friend, uh, Ashok Joshi, who is just yes. a phenomenal business leader from India. And he's just a pillar of the business community here in Utah. And we are talking about the importance of India, uh, it, it, particularly moving forward. And I feel like India is just this, just this tremendous market and country full of incredible people and a very, very talented human capital that is starting to emerge as a global economic powerhouse. And, and we just made the comment that, that there seems to be different times and seasons for different countries and different regions of the world. And that India's time to be a global leader, particularly on economic issues, uh, is arriving and, and maybe in some ways has arrived. And so as I sit back uh, from the World Trade Center Utah perspective, what that means to me is that we have to be focusing in on really understanding the Indian market, building out our, our, our network of partners there, helping to communicate that to our Utah companies. I think typically in, in the past, when you talk to uh, many Utah companies about India and, and they recognize the potential, but there are a lot of you know, regulatory issues. It can be difficult bureaucratically. Uh, you have some, some corruption uh, issues that have been uh, in, in different parts of India in the past and a, a market that in many ways is, is fragmented. And so for a, a company here, that is looking at the Indian market, it can be challenging. It can be a little scary. There can be a lot of obstacles. And what I view in our role is, is to really make sure that we understand that market so that we can help reduce the obstacles for Utah companies, either to sell into the Indian market, to produce in India, to sell in India, to produce in India, to sell elsewhere in the region or around the world. Um, but those are all great opportunities that exist. And you know, for many years, you know, many companies have looked to India as, as like the back office for outsourcing, you know, call centers or programming or whatnot. And there's still a significant value proposition there. But the opportunity is so much bigger than that. And so you mentioned uh, very briefly, so wrapping up the virtual trade mission to India that we did last summer. And we had the opportunity to partner with the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, with World Trade Center Mumbai, uh, with IBM. Uh, we had the chief economist of IBM join us as well as the uh, development commissioner for uh, the provincial government around uh, Mumbai to provide a bit of a, a, a broader perspective. But it was so important to have uh, these different perspectives from a, a US uh, embassy perspective, from a World Trade Center perspective, a provincial government perspective, and then this great IBM, a, a great global company perspective. And we, we used all of that to help our Utah companies gain a deeper appreciation about how to do business in India and then following that, we had uh, many people who wanted to follow up, have additional conversations, companies that have, uh, are now pursuing business opportunities. And I see that trend continuing and accelerating, which is why us connecting is so important and why yes. this is going to be an area of focus uh, moving forward for World Trade Center Utah. I must really thank, thank you, Miles, for your uh, generous uh, comments and appreciation about India. Uh, yes, we have uh, we a large market and uh, there's, a, there's a huge potential that we, we need to unleash. Uh, yes, there are concerns. I, I agree, from, agree with you. And, uh, and this, those are being getting addressed also from time to time. Uh, it is not as if the government of India is, is, is silent about it and is very vocal. In fact, the prime minister has taken a lot of steps in these directions to improve the uh, ease of doing business index he has improved and uh, is be constantly uh, nudging the state governments even to take the you know to improve or from their part so miles before before i move on to the uh, to the afghan issue uh, and take your expert on that 
you know india is is the home of lot of family companies lot of startups lot of small companies uh, how do you yeah. think uh, how do you really think that uh, in the state of utah or the businesses from the state of utah and and we in india could could help them grow or or, or help them collaborate with each other if you know in, in 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 any country you know startups and family businesses are often the backbone of the economy and what we find is is they typically start as being you know local uh, local companies but then over time they grow and, and after a while uh, they can become some of the largest most influential businesses and, and, and again uh, continue to be the bedrock of the economy not just a small but then they go to medium and the very large multinational corporations they all can be you know family businesses and so the the, the key then is to focus in on how do you help them go from the startup phase that you mentioned and grow to become very large and successful companies and so what we have found uh, in, in Utah is we're working with our companies here but also with companies elsewhere is these uh, family-owned businesses and these startups often have very similar values they want to grow they want to succeed they want to innovate they are lean and they are hungry and they are highly motivated and so the challenge is oftentimes they are so focused on getting the business going and focusing on that business that sometimes it's hard for them to take a step back and look at the bigger picture yeah. to try to see you know greater right. market opportunities and that's what we find ourselves doing a lot is saying hey to the business owner you're working so hard to make it work it's like you're doing five different jobs and you're working uh, around the clock and you're trying to make payroll let us come in and just spend a little bit of time understanding your business. You keep focusing on growing your business, but let us go and try to find some market opportunities. Let us go in a very low cost or distraction to the business, help you put together a market entry strategy, and then let us go and line up some meetings to see if we can't help you break into another market. And what we find in the United States, and I'm confident it's true around the world, is that companies that are engaging in international trade grow faster, Yes. great jobs quicker those jobs are higher paying jobs and those jobs are far more resilient in economic downturns and so there's immense public good and benefit that comes by helping our companies become uh, not just a local company but becoming a global company and that's why we have so many people who are willing to provide support and assistance to these small businesses to help them grow in this manner because when they do then again, they become medium and then large companies, and that brings such important economic benefits and resiliency uh, to the state, to our nation, and to the world. And so that's where we want to work with companies at anywhere to plug in and figure out how to help su support them and how to help them get connected with Utah companies. And so and if, if anybody who's listening uh, is, is interested in learning more about what we do, uh, they can go to our website, wtcutah.com. Uh, we've got some great information there. There's also a place where they can enter in their email address. And, and a lot of what we do is virtual. And so they're more than welcome to plug in and participate. And if they have a sit, need assistance uh, connecting with anybody here in the state of Utah, you know, we'd love to hear from them so that we can plug in and, and, and be good partners right. to them. Absolutely. Uh, now, Miles, I cannot possibly leave you uh, without asking you to dwell upon the withdrawal of international coalition forces from Afghanistan. And this situation is, I guess, very fluid and worrying. And as an expert and ex with the experience in the region, how do you see, see things unfolding? And, uh, uh, and secondly, what do you think international community needs to do to achieve some degree of uh, stability? And I'm asking you this question because you have a uh, terrific experience of, of that region. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's such a difficult, uh, difficult issue. I know people all around the world have had a uh, a, a wide range of emotions over the past few months as, as we've seen this incredible human tragedy and, and, and national security failure uh, taking place in Afghanistan. And, and it makes me think back to the time that I spent a, a little bit of time in Afghanistan. Uh, my, my wife and I were living in Dushanbe, Tajikistan, studying Farsi as students, and we wanted to go get some firsthand experience in the country before I knew that I'd be working uh, as a policy uh, maker and as a diplomat, and that Afghanistan would be part of uh, the, the issue set that I was working on. And so we traveled uh, across the northern part of the country and just had an incredible experience. 
And so my heart has really been breaking uh, over the past couple of months as I uh, think back to the wonderful people that we had the opportunity to interact with who had the same aspirations as people uh, anywhere. I remember we stayed with a family uh, that had a bunch of, of, of young uh, teenage boys. They're 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 years old. Uh, all of them carried themselves like they were 30 uh, because teenagers in Afghanistan typically don't get the luxury of youth. Uh, they are uh, thrown in and treated as adults as, as soon as they're teenagers. But they talked about wanting to be doctors and lawyers and one talked about wanting to be a politician so they could make sure that the Taliban didn't come back. And they talked about the horrors of, of the Taliban rule in the, in the 90s. And so it really is just a tragic situation. I think about them now back under Taliban rule. And I'll just say this. Um, I have been deeply critical of uh, the Biden administration because they have framed this as an issue of either we stay in Afghanistan forever or things play out the way they have over the past few months, which is a false choice that, that completely rejects the, the, the common sense uh, approach to having a very uh, simple plan, but a, a focused plan to manage a transition that would give the Afghan government uh, the greatest opportunity to, 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 to thrive, as well as making sure that we uh, could have avoided this just absolutely heart-wrenching human tragedy that's unfolded over the past few weeks. And as, as I've looked at that, and as I've talked to you know, former colleagues, uh, current uh, uh, officials in the administration, some of our ambassadors, some of our partners around the region, it's clear that there wasn't a plan. Uh, the, the focus was, let's just pack up and go home, but there wasn't a plan to say, how do we do this in a way that's gonna protect uh, not just US interests, but interests of our partners around the world and, and on Afghanistan, the U.S. and Indian interest is very much aligned. Uh, India doesn't want to see the Taliban take over. They don't want to see a, a human tragedy uh, taking place in Afghanistan, just like the United States doesn't want that. So the, there were countries that were willing and ready to step up and to try to help manage an orderly transition. And the way that this would, would, should have happened is not that difficult. It's like, OK, if you want to end the combat role, First off, you need to get all the heavy equipment out. I've seen reports that talk about $80 billion, a billion with a B of equipment that the United States has left in Afghanistan and now the Taliban has control over, very sophisticated equipment. And that also is equipment that uh, China and Russia, I guarantee you right now, there are people with uh, suitcases full of money in Kabul buying up uh, you know, millions of dollars worth of very sophisticated uh, military equipment for pennies on the dollar. And they're taking that back to China, they're taking it to Russia, they're taking it to Iran to reverse engineer it so they can produce similar things and also to assess the vulnerabilities. And so that's gonna come at immense cost to the United States. So the plan should have been get the equipment out first, get the civilians out, both American citizens, uh, the, the uh, enable other countries, India included to get their citizens out. And then to make sure that we fulfill our moral obligation to the Afghans they worked with us for 20 years and now are in extreme danger. You get the civilians out first. And then after you've accomplished that, then you figure out how do you support the Afghan army through a period of transition to then pull out and, and, and end this combat role while continuing to increase, uh, to, to provide uh, diplomatic support, humanitarian support, uh, military aid as necessary. And then, of course, there's, there's intelligence and covert uh, operation opportunities. Um, instead of going through a very simple phased process like that, the Biden administration just set a goal to be gone uh, by the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which was a, not a good uh, symbolic day. And they just, they just packed up and went home. We left Bagram Air Base, one of the largest air bases anywhere in the, the world for the United States. We left it in the middle of the night. We didn't even tell our Afghan partners there that we were leaving that night. That's not how you manage a good transition. That creates a vacuum. That creates uh, a vacuum of power. It creates a perception that, of abandonment. And so there's no question to see how the Afghan army and the Afghan government folded and how the Taliban were able to, to come take over the country. And it's just uh, tragic to think about the, the, the individuals and the families that now are bearing the consequences of that. So I know that was a long answer, but uh, this has been uh, such an important issue and something that is, uh, you know, been been very emotional for for anybody who's been working on Afghanistan or in Afghanistan for uh, for the past twenty years.
No, you are. No, no, thank you for the long answer because you are an expert on that subject, and probably you only could have could have stated uh, all this or the, the interpretation that you have given. Uh, but thank you for that, Miles. Uh, Miles, this has been fascinating talk, uh, and I really sincerely thank you for your your valuable time early morning today, your time and and spending so much uh, uh, time to elaborate issues. Now, uh, would you like to make any closing comments, Miles? I just like to say thank you to you. You are a great example of the way uh, that we can build bridges of a friendship, of partnership, of communication, sharing knowledge uh, between partners. And, and here we are. If you think about a globe right now, and, and, and this has become very, we're all used to, to, to doing Zoom calls and everything. But just take a second to think about the fact that we are literally on opposite sides of the earth right now, having this very comfortable, natural conversation and that you are going to send this out to all of your closest friends uh, that are that are uh, viewers and listeners uh, to uh, to your India Power Talk series, and that's just incredible. And, and you have built these bridges of information flows and partnership and friendship, and that then creates uh, so much opportunity for us to work together for for people who listen in to connect with us. And as we share this with our network, for our companies to connect with you and others, and there is great productivity increases that comes from what you're working on. And that really truly does lead to success for companies, which creates jobs, which creates more prosperity, yeah. which it has a, a, a leavening effect on our, our communities, our states, our nations and the world. And so what you're doing is so important. So it's just been an honor to spend some time with you. So grateful for the opportunity to connect. And I look forward to this just being you know, the, the, the first chapter of an active partnership where we can go and try to take this conversation and facilitate positive action that wouldn't have occurred had we not had the chance to meet and, and spend some time together today. I, I just cannot, uh, uh, you know, agree more with you, Miles, and it has been such a fan, fantastic association and, and, and conversation with you, with Ron Gunnell, with Ashok Joshi, you know, he has been instrumental in, in organizing these talks, uh, helping me to connect the right people in, in state of Utah. Not only that, but guiding me uh, and uh, and driving us uh, to the right direction. Uh, so thank you once again, Miles, for your valuable time and insights. It has been a great pleasure talking to you. Uh, I would like to thank I would like to thank the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce as well as the Indian Chamber of Commerce, Wadhwani Foundation, Law Siku, and the India SME Accelerator Network. Uh, let me conclude with the humble prayer to the Almighty uh, to bestow mankind with the right spirit to fight the coronavirus, uh, whatever balance it is now, <laughs> uh, and help restore uh, peace, prosperity, and well-being. Thank you, Miles. Thank you very much.